I love this uh, question and answer in the catechism today. This is question 71. What is the reason annexed to the fifth commandment? Of course, by now we're familiar with this idea of what is, you know, commanded, what is forbidden, what is annexed. These reasons that come along with each of these commandments. And here it says the reason annexed to the fifth commandment is a promise of long life and prosperity. And then notice how uh, they have this little parentheses in there. As far as it shall serve for God's glory and their own good. The promise is, is uh, conditional in a sense because it depends on God's glory and the good of the person. To all such as keep this commandment. That is a typo on your pastor's part there as keep, not leap. You're not leaping over the commandment here. You're keeping it. <clears throat> the reason annexed to the fifth commandment is a promise of long life and prosperity as far as it shall serve for God's glory and their own good to all such as keep this commandment. This, of course, comes over into the New Testament. In Ephesians, Paul talks about this very thing. He mentions the uh, annex, actually, that the promise is to us uh, as far as we keep the commandment. First Samuel chapter 7 today, so if you'll take your Bible and join me there. First Samuel chapter 7, and eh, we're just going to read a few verses today. Uh, I may get you out of here uh, before the lunch crowd, but I didn't feel like, I just felt like that this was all we really should... Um, should look at today. We're just going to read down through verse 6. 
1 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 6. The men of Kiriath Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kiriath Jerim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, if ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. I entitled this uh, message today, Longing for the Lord. Longing for the Lord. The men of kiriath Jerim came and fetched up the ark. Now we know that chapter 6 ended with the men of uh, uh, Beth Shemesh, sending to kiriath Jerim and saying, come down and get the ark. And they did. They came, in, they came down and got it. They put it in the house of a man named Abinadab, and his son Eliezer uh, was to keep the ark of the Lord. And then we're going to really begin our meditation here in verse 2. The ark is gone. It's, it's in somebody's house in a country village, and it's no longer at the tabernacle they didn't send it back there, which I think is fascinating. It did not go back to the tabernacle. Maybe because there wasn't a priest's family there to minister to the Lord or to the people with the ark there. And so they just put it in a Levitical home. But it's gone. People aren't resorting now to Shiloh like they were. Samuel's ministry is growing during this time because you'll notice there in verse 2 that it says it's 20 years so all of this time, Samuel, being the last of the judges, is now judging Israel. And Mizpah, the place where they gather, is one of his stopping points. It's a, it's a place where he goes on a, sort of like a circuit, you know, and he preaches. <clears throat> when I was first in ministry in central Kentucky, uh, one of my good friends in ministry was the pastor of the Methodist church. And... I never knew that Methodists did this, but apparently they do in places like uh, rural Kentucky. <clears throat> they, have, uh, they have routes. They, they have uh, part-time pulpits. And so he was on a circuit, and he had three churches under his ministry. And he would preach in those different pulpits different Sundays of the month. And that's what, that's, that's a long time practice. And that's what Sam, Samuel's doing. He's on this route and he's preaching. <clears throat> but it's a long time, 20 years. Can you just imagine that? 20 years, no ark, no tabernacle, no Shiloh, no sacrifice like that. It's all, it's all very, very long. And you'll notice at the end of verse 2 it says, the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. I put in my notes here a passage from Song of Solomon. I read from it this morning. This is why I read from it this morning. I read it, the passage after what I'm about to read, but <clears throat> listen to this longing here in, in Solomon's writing. He wrote, I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened my door to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul fainted when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen went about the city, found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him. 
that I am sick of love. Solomon writing this lovesick poem <clears throat> for his beloved who had withdrawn his hand. And so Israel finds themselves in the same condition. Their beloved had withdrawn his hand. No more ark, no more presence, no more Shiloh, no more sacrifice, no more celebration. None of what we read in chapter 1 with Elkanah's family going to Shiloh once a year and having a celebration and eating the fellowship meal and making the sacrifice and being a part of the community. None of that is happening now. They have been withdrawn. And the word here that is translated lamented after here in, uh, in the King James translation, the word, the Hebrew word means to lament or to mourn, but when it's used with the word after, we understand the sense that they longed for him. Just as when someone passes, and I know we've all had this experience in our lives, someone close to us passes, and it's not during the funeral or before the funeral or you know, directly after the funeral, but it's that long period after that you mourn for the person because you begin to find ways in which they're not there any longer. Their absence becomes a weight and you wished for something to fill that void, you begin to mourn and to long after them. That's the idea here. <clears throat> it's a, a brokenness, really, in Israel. A contriteness has overtaken the people. And this is not a bad thing. It's a very good thing when it's a longing for the Lord. He had withdrawn his hand. The Puritans were very keen on that phrase and often talked about the Lord withdrawing his hand. Uh, it's not that the Lord's presence isn't with the believer because, of course, he is always with the believer. He tabernacles within us, but it's that sense that sometimes sin uh, muddies the vision. It clouds over the relationship. It, it sort of hazes up the, the glass even further, you know, and, and we feel separated. It's not that we are, but it's just that something has happened that makes us feel distant from him. Maybe our own busyness, maybe our own sinfulness, maybe our own laziness, whatever it might be. And there are plenty of things that we could attribute to this. <laughs> the, the devil's uh, tool cabinet is filled with things to make us feel as though the Lord has withdrawn his hand. And so Israel was feeling the very same thing. And I think they knew why. We're going to find out that they did know why. I brought with me a, a poem from William Cowper. He was a Puritan. One of the things that the Puritans were excellent at was their devotional thought. And, and one of the things that comes out of their devotional life was a lot of great poetry. George, George Herbert probably is the chief of the Puritan poets, but Cowper and Ann Thompson and others are excellent poets. And he writes this poem called Walking with God. He says, Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road that leads me to the Lamb. Where is the blessedness I knew when I first saw the Lord? Where is the soul-refreshing view of Jesus and his word? What peaceful hours I once enjoyed, how sweet their memories still, but they have left an aching void the world can never fill. The dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. So shall my walk be close with God, calm and serene my frame, so pure a light shall mark the road that leads me to the Lamb. This was the poem, I think, that maybe the Israelites could have written as they longed after the Lord. Verse 3 says, Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel. Samuel knew what was going on. He could feel their mourning. No doubt he felt it acutely himself because he was in the temple. He was in the tabernacle with Eli and his sons. He slept in the room just outside of the ark itself. He knew that the presence, 
being gone was difficult for them as well as for him. And even though he knows that, he uses it here when he speaks to them. Because he says, if you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts. I think that even though he knew their lamenting and their desire for the Lord, he wanted to see just how sincere, how serious they were. And he, so he says, if you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. It's one thing to acknowledge someone's mourning and desire in this way. <clears throat> it's another thing to put it to them that it's the Ashtaroth and the gods, the strange gods, that's the cause of it. But Israel wasn't rebuffed by this at all. They, they didn't stiffen their neck, you know. The, the hackles on the back were not standing up. They were ready because they were broken. They were contrite. They knew that this was why the Lord's presence felt removed. And so they repented. And this is the first step. Samuel gives it to him straight. He doesn't play around with flowery language. He doesn't confuse his words. He just tells them truly, put away. If you really are going to return to the Lord, then put away the gods. Put away the Ashtaroth. Let's get this thing right. Because the Lord is not going to have a divided heart. He's not going to have your games. There's not going to be a duplicitness in your religion any longer. Put them away. If you really, really long after the Lord, then let's do something about it. Repent. <clears throat> if you're serious about serving the Lord, then the strange gods have to go. There's that old, uh, that old saying I like to hear. I like to say it to myself. If you, you can't shack up with the devil and expect God to pay the rent, that's what they were doing. Or as Elijah said, how long shall you haunt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. Make a decision. Make a decision. Put away the strange gods and the Ashtaroth from, from among you. Otherwise, stop crying about it. Enjoy your gods and stop lamenting after the Lord. And then he says this, prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. To prepare would suggest that they were to put things in order so that holiness among them would be the standard. If they were going to put away the gods, then they could no longer live according to those strange gods any longer. They had to live a life of holiness like the Lord had taught them, like they had been living prior to the ark's removal. They were to prepare their hearts unto holiness and serve him exclusively. And notice here that they are to serve him only, no other gods, no one else on the throne of their heart. You know, the world will put up with your Christianity as long as you say, however you want to do it, it's fine with me. But when you say Jesus is the only way, period, and everybody needs to come before him, then, folks, they're not going to put up with that. Exclusivity in religion is no longer allowed. That kind of language now would be considered hateful. <clears throat> Samuel doesn't care about that, though. He says to them, serve him only. Serve him only. No other gods, no more excuses. Put them away. Walk in holiness and serve the Lord. No one else on the throne of your heart. And then this is the overflow of all of that. He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. But they didn't return to the Lord so that they could just get out from under the Philistines. That's not why they're returning to the Lord. That's not the point here. They are lamenting after the Lord. They're longing for his presence. Their desire is for him to be close to them again, for them to feel that hand near the hole of the door, for them to feel his presence, for them to spy him through the window, sporting in the garden. That's what they want. They want his nearness again, his near presence. They don't care about the Philistines. That's the side issue. You know, whenever you mix Christian religion with what you want, <clears throat> and this really is the goal, the thing that you want, you really don't have Christian religion. You just have formulaic religion, dead religion. That's all it is. Because if this is all you want, if it's not the Lord that you really want, if it's the thing that the Lord's going to give you, then don't pretend any longer. 
It's this. This is your God. This is what you serve, the thing that you want. You want freedom from the Philistines? Okay. That you want freedom from the Philistines, but don't say, I'll serve the Lord if I get this. Samson says, or Samuel says, if you'll just put away the gods from among you and serve him only and prepare your hearts, then he's going to deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. He doesn't say when, he just says it'll happen. But that's not what they're after. They're lovesick. They are lovesick for his return. They don't care if the Philistines are over them or the Amorites are over them or whoever might be lording it over them. It may be really bad, but the thing that's even worse is... They're longing for the Lord. Which is worse in your life? Your current condition or your longing for the Lord? Serving him and having his near presence was the goal, <clears throat> not their faint and vain desires. And Samuel said to them, gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. Well, look at here. They're going to have a prayer meeting. Come to Mizpah. Mizpah was on the circuit that Samuel rode. And so he says, well, you just come up here, and I'll pray for you. And what happens? <clears throat> they gather together. They all came there. Everybody who was desiring the Lord came there. They would have gone anywhere, Samuel said. If he had said, come to Gath, they would have gathered at Gath. If he had said, come to Jerusalem, they would have gathered in Jerusalem. If he had said, come to Dan or come to Beersheba, wherever it was, they didn't care. They would have gone there because they longed for the Lord. They were willing to put away the gods from among them. They were willing to prepare their hearts. They were willing to serve the Lord. They wanted his presence so dearly. It, doesn't, it didn't matter what Samuel said they were going to do it. And they came. They gathered there in great abundance. They wanted nothing more than the Lord in his presence. And they drew water and they poured it out before the Lord. Do you see the emptiness? The pouring out of water represents. This is all that we have. This is, this is the pouring out of their hearts. This is what this represents. The pouring out of their hearts there on the ground before the Lord. They are so contrite. They are so broken. All they want is his presence. They don't care about the Philistines. Let them do what they're going to do. They don't care about what their neighbors have to say or what anybody else has to say. It's not about that now. They're just pouring themselves out before the Lord. And then it says, notice, that they fasted on that day. Fasting has an effect on the soul when it's paired with seeking the Lord through prayer. And it doesn't matter what you fast, whether it's food or television, whether it's pleasant entertainment, whether it's words, whether it's music, doesn't matter what it is, whatever it is you fast. Ladies and gentlemen, when you pair it with prayer and you seek the Lord on those times, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And it has an effect on the soul, and that's what these people were doing. And they didn't care that they were fasting. They probably hadn't eaten for days. <laughs> they just wanted the presence of the Lord. And so they went there. I, I would imagine maybe they even went there fasting. But they get there, and they pour the water out before the Lord, and they just don't eat. This, this isn't a time of celebration. This is a time of mourning. I'm not going to eat now. I want the Lord's presence. Lord, see how serious this is. I'm not going to even eat. I can't eat. I'm so lovesick. I so want your presence with me right now. And they fasted on that day. And then here we have the great payoff right here. I was listening to the Reds yesterday, and one of the Reds pitchers had a batter on the, on the uh, plate, and the batter had a 3-2 count. And the pitcher was winding up, brought his hands up to the belt, and stood there and looked at the plate. And the announcer said, and here's the payoff pitch. And here's the payoff pitch in our lesson this morning. We have sinned against the Lord. I haven't heard them say anything yet. Not a word. This is the first we hear. This is how deep their lovesickness went. We have sinned against the Lord. Confession of sin. They knew it. Samuel knew it. The Philistines knew it, probably. The Lord knew it, but no one had said a word until this moment. And then they say it. They put away the gods, that's great. They prepared their hearts, that's great. 
They served the Lord only. That's great. But yet they hadn't addressed the problem, which was sin in their hearts. We, notice that, we have. It's not just he has or she has. It's all of us, me included. We have sinned against the Lord. When was the last time you confessed your sin to the Lord? If you don't, your sin will eat like a cancer, like a canker into your soul. Twist your mind and distort your vision. It will become the thing that you see or don't see. It will be the thing that colors your very relationships, not only with the Lord, but with others as well. But these people, beautiful, they made their confession. I have sinned. We have sinned. <clears throat> this is why we're in this condition. This is why we are longing after him, because our sin has forced him away. His presence, we want it back. We need it back. And they didn't care what they had to do. And they looked at Samuel and they looked at each other and they said, we have sinned. And then you see that the passage there in verse 6, it closes with these words, and Samuel judged the children of Israel. You know, the, the judges, if you go back into the book of Judges, you'll find that the judge never really steps up and does his work until the people understand their need. When they realize it's their sin that has caused the issue and they repent of that sin, God raises up a judge. And then the judge is given the ability, the vision by God, to lead the people out of the problem. But first they always begin with repentance. Repentance of sin and confession. Always. So Samuel judging, we've not seen this word used of Samuel yet, but now we do because the people have confessed. We have sinned. Now Samuel can step into the fullness of his ministry to judge the children of Israel. And it doesn't mean that he stands behind some pulpit or some bench somewhere and wags his finger at them. No, that's not what the judge did. The judge was there to lead them to the Lord to a fuller relationship and to see the deliverance that God had promised. But the, again, these people, they don't care about that. All they want, all they want is a closer walk. You may be feeling in your own heart the call of your closet to come and pray, to put down your housework, to put down <clears throat> your chores, to put down whatever duties that always seem to be so much. There's never a day that there's not something calling you to work, calling you away. But you hear the closet calling you to more time, to more fellowship, to more intimacy. I encourage you, prepare your hearts and serve him only. When the, call, when the closet calls, go there. When you're watching that television show and, and you feel the Spirit of God say, turn it off and pick up the Bible. Turn it off and pick up that devotional book. Do it. Turn it off. Pick up the book. Let silence surround you and read and meditate on God's Word. Longing for Him is not a bad thing. It's really a very good thing. I think sometimes we think it's a bad thing because of the way it makes us feel. Don't worry about the feeling. Seek Him and earnestly desire His presence even more in your life. We're going to read next in, chapter, in verse 7 that the devil didn't like that and he decided he was going to come against the children of Israel. The devil's never going to like it when you listen to the Spirit's call. He's never going to like it when you confess your sin. He's never going to like it when you put away your gods. He's never going to like it when you prepare your heart. Never. So, okay. Let him not like it. Follow the Lord and seek him. 
dying and lost. Father, that, those are the words of this hymn. But saved and alive is the hope. We are not hopeless. Oh, but we have great hope in Jesus. Thank you for saving us. Be near to us, Father, for without you, life would be so empty and meaningless, so full of failure and hopeless. We ask, Lord, that you would walk with us today and into the days to come, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.